Have you heard of Pope Francis's encyclical on climate change? Does it have anything to do with the mark of the beast? That's our topic on this edition of His Voice Today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. The release date was June 18, 2015. It was a milestone papal encyclical addressing the issue of climate change. It was released worldwide, translated into many languages. The media was all over it. And Tim Saxton and I, my associate, are here to discuss this issue in the light of biblical prophecy. Uh, Tim, it's great having you as part of the White Horse Media team. We've known each other for a long time and we've been working together for quite a while. And uh, let's go right into the topic. You've done a lot of research on this. So why don't just for the viewers who aren't that familiar with this topic, just give us a background on the encyclical climate change and what the issues are. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. For 20 years now, world leaders have been attempting to address the issue with climate change, and they've been unable to come up with any solution. Now, as you may know, climate change is what's being portrayed in the media and among scientists as one of the causes of, of evil in our world. Things like global warming, global warming that's resulting in natural Extreme disasters. weather, disasters, even the California drought. It's all attributed to climate change. Okay. All of these storms, these crazy storms and incredible hurricanes and typhoons, it's all because of climate change is what they're saying. Record hot weather, record cold weather, yes. crops yes. failing, uh, polar ice caps melting, waters rising, things like this. Yes. Now, what, but what we're also seeing is that governments are saying climate change is a threat to their security. China, in March, uh, the BBC carried a report that China declared that climate change was a threat to their security. In May, uh, NPR reported that President Barack Obama said that climate change was a threat to the security of the United States. So we see governments jumping on board this saying, we've got to do something. This is serious about climate change, but what can we do? Right. Let me just inject an article I just read from Fox News showing that it's not just government and scientists, but it's... Uh, it's the media, as you mentioned. Uh, June 23, 2015, the title of the article was Climate Change, Health Risk is a Medical Emergency, Experts Warn. Warn, extreme weather events such as floods and heat waves bring rising risks of infectious diseases, poor nutrition, and stress. Specialists said, uh, we see climate change as a major health issue that's often neglected in policy debates. And then it says here, climate change is a medical emergency it demands an emergency response, and that's a quote from Hugh Montgomery, director of UCL's Institute for Human Health and Performance, and he's a co-author of the report, uh, the report mentioned in this article. So a lot of people are talking about this, and the Pope is talking about this as well. The, you, correct. In June 18 of this year, the Pope released his encyclical that they've been working on for months. And in the encyclical, I'm going to give some quotes here, he says that climate change, I'm quoting, represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity today. And again, in his document, he says, he seeks to, quote, bring the whole human family together to address it. So oftentimes, papal encyclicals are addressed to Catholics for the Catholic Church, but this papal, papal encyclical is different. It's addressed to the entire world. And it says, we have a world problem, and we must all come together to address this problem. And it's obvious that the world does have a problem. It does. And the Pope recognizes that. Uh, he sees that this world is a mess, that disasters are increasing, there's a whole host of things that are happening, and whether the science uh, and climate change, global warming, we know there's a big debate on that. Whatever the right side is or the wrong side concerning all of the science, the fact is that this planet is in trouble and the Pope does recognize that, and he also recognizes significantly that the issue really has a lot to do with, with human beings, what we're doing. And, and biblically, there's no question that if Adam hadn't have sinned, it would be a different world. There wouldn't be earthquakes and fires and floods. And so scripturally, uh, we do know that sin is at the heart of the problems on this planet. Uh, there's a friend of mine, Scott uh, Christensen, who wrote a masterful book called Planet in Distress, published by the Review and Herald, and he looks at the systems of the world and how the environmental systems and how they've been affected by sin. And we certainly see prophetically that things are going to be downhill, going downhill, until Jesus comes. Very true. And you know, in, in his encyclical, the Pope says, uh, 
He laments the breakdown of society. That's a quote, the breakdown of society. And he says that we need to, I'm going to quote again, we need to slow down and recover the values and the great goals by our unrestrained delusions of grandeur. Okay, so we, we do have a problem. Humans are involved with this problem. And but we then need to the, slow down. And the solution, so yeah, in the encyclical, he moves into a solution which involves slowing down and let's move into the Sabbath issue that the encyclical strongly addresses. Yes, the, uh, pointing back to Genesis, the Pope talks about the corruption that was in the world before the flood and how God brought salvation through Noah and that after the flood, there was a restart to humanity. And from there, he goes in talking about the seventh day Sabbath, uh, where people rested every week. And then he talked about the land every seven years uh, that in the Old Testament, the land would have rest. And then at the end of seven, seven year cycles was considered a year of jubilee, jubilee, a year to restart. And that's all in the encyclical. That's all in the encyclical. That's been read, read around the world by yes. media and, and governments and scientists and Catholics and Protestants and the list just goes on and on. And looking at the problem, he's pointing back to, to the Sabbath issue. Now keep going. Does he, when he does that, is he then referring to the whole world coming together and keeping the seventh day Sabbath, which is the biblical Sabbath, or a different Sabbath? Well, at, towards the end of the encyclical in section 237, he says, and I'm going to quote here, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So at the end, he is linking Sunday as the replacement for the Sabbath of Scripture. Right. I've got the same quote there, and he continues and says, Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation. In this way, Christian spirituality incorporates the value of relaxation and festivity. So he's definitely pointing to uh, a Sunday solution as part of the solution to global warming. And to me, it makes sense from a certain perspective, at least as most people would look at this, that families are in trouble, the environment's in trouble, uh, governments are in trouble, there's too many carbon emissions and pollution that are going up into the ozone and affecting the environment to some extent. And we all need to come back to God, which we do. We do need to rest, which we do. We do need to strengthen our families, which we do. Uh, and, and yet he's pointing to Sunday as the day for this to happen. And he certainly is promoting this very strongly. Well, yes, in the encyclical he talks about, and I'm gonna quote again, rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. So you can see there he's taking the day of rest and saying if we have rest, it's going to invigorate all of us to be more concerned about those about us. And he sees Sunday as that day. Sunday as not, the day Not as he sees it, the ancient Jewish Sabbath, but now it's really Sunday, the day of the resurrection. That's the day that would help humanity come to a, a new start to help solve the problems Exactly. Of global warming. Now, exactly. uh, Tim, this to me was extremely significant. The same day that the Pope's encyclical came out, June 18, 2015, here is a press release from the Office of the Secretary, Office of the Press Secretary at the White House for immediate release, title, Statement by the Pope, by the President on Pope Francis's encyclical. And this is what President Obama said the same day. I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis' encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case, clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position for action on climate, on global climate change. And then he said, quote, I believe the United States must be a leader in this effort, which, uh, which is why I am committed to taking bold actions at home and abroad to cut carbon pollution. I look forward to discussing these issues with Pope Francis when he visits the White House in September. To me, this is very significant, and, and I think we just need to spend, spend a little bit of time talking about Bible prophecy. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists have a definite understanding of the book of Revelation chapter 13, which in many ways does, does uh, agree with Protestants for a long time concerning the identity of the first beast of Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, there are two beasts. The first one is called the beast from the sea in verses 1 to 10. And then in verse 11, there's a second beast that comes out of the earth. 
So you've got the sea beast and the earth beast, and then as you move down toward the final closing moments of time, both beasts are cooperating together, and they are working together to enforce the mark of the beast. Now, in harmony with uh, Protestants like Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Mennonites, uh, the list goes on and on, at least about 100 years ago, Seventh-day Adventists believe that the first beast of Revelation 13 is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church. That does not mean that Catholics are bad, but the system of Catholicism is pointed out right there in the Bible. Uh, Matthew Henry is the most famous commentary in, in Christian history. He interprets it exactly that same way. And then the second beast we understand to be the United States of America. From a lot of Bible study, I have a little book on this, a little pocket book that Whitehorse Media uh, has available called The United States in Bible Prophecy. And anyway, when you look at the prophecy, it's clear in Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12, that the second beast representing America is going to be cooperating with the first beast representing the Roman Catholic Church, and they will be working together at the end of time, and especially the second beast will promote the first beast and eventually enforce the mark of the first beast. That's what prophecy says. So when I read President, here we've got an encyclical where the Pope is promoting sun, a Sunday solution to a global crisis, and then you've got President Obama coming out and admiring the Pope's encyclical and saying that the United States must be a leader in this effort to help implement the Pope's suggestion suggestions, this is Revelation chapter 13 being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know, the, um, the Pope is certainly going to be pushing his agenda. In fact, um, I've got a quote from a New York Times article, June 13 of this year, in which Michael Zerny, a Jesuit priest who is involved in helping the Pope draft his encyclical, said that regarding the encyclical, this is certainly an agenda-setting document. In other words, this document sets the agenda for the world. And that's where Pope Francis is going with this. Pope Francis is com coming to the United States to meet with the President in September 23, the United Nations, I'm sorry, the Joint Session of Congress on September 24, and the United Nations on September 25. And he's going to be talking about climate change and what the world needs to be doing. And surely he'll be addressing and promoting his encyclical. Yes, yes he will be. In fact, um, I remind of a quote from Helen Clark, administrator of the United Nations Development Program, who said that Francis has a quote, emerging agenda on social issues, and she adds, he is a man in a hurry. In other words, he's not just addressing climate change, Steve, he is in a hurry to address it. He, like he's, he's got a deadline. Right, he senses something big is about to happen, and, and he, he's right. He's right that the planet is in trouble. He's right that human sin is a contributing factor to this. He's wrong on looking at the signs of the world and concluding that he can bring the world together to help make things better uh, on, on a long-term basis when Scripture says that these are signs of the second coming of Christ and that God's plan is not to put a Band-Aid on, on a global problem but to get rid of sin when Jesus Christ returns. And that is not a message that the Pope is preaching. Now back to the Sabbath issue. Uh, I have a quote here from a Catholic catechism, the Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine written by Peter Geierman. I believe it was published in uh, 1946. And on page 50, it says here, question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, there's a lot of history behind this we don't have time to get into. Other Whitehorse Media books uh, go into this history, but the Roman Catholic Church claims that they changed the Bible Sabbath, and here I've got the Ten Commandments, the big tables of stone, and the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it, and it says clearly that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. That was written with the finger of God. And the Roman Catholic Church came along historically and said that we should change that to Sunday, which they did. That's the reason why the majority of Christians today keep Sunday. And they also claim that it is a sign or a mark of their authority. Right. And Revelation 13 tells us that in the closing moments of time, the lamb-like beast representing America will cooperate with the first beast representing the Roman Church and will lead out in the efforts to enforce the mark of the first beast, which is Sunday. 
Sunday is purely a tradition of men. It's not in the New Testament as a holy day. It does not replace the seven-day Sabbath. There's no question about it. And as we look at these events around us, uh, we can see prophecy being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. We're not fully there yet, but the stage is, is being set rapidly for a Sunday solution in the midst of an escalating global crisis to try to come back to God, come back to family, come back to rest, uh, help our bodies, help the environment, cut down carbon emissions. The, the reasoning, uh, it makes sense from one perspective, but if we really look at our Bibles, it will become ultimately the enforcement of the mark of the beast. And just to mention something else that to me is significant, uh, what we're saying right now is not an aberrant Seventh-day Adventist view. I mentioned Scott Christensen who wrote the book Planet in Distress uh, on June 26. The Review and Herald published his article online. The article is entitled The Pope's Encyclical and Adventist Perspective and he says right in his article that uh, the Pope's document is amazing in its hints at the near fulfillment of prophecy. And he goes right down showing how this ties in with the, bar with the mark of the beast. Uh, he says, the massive global media response to the encyclical is proof that the world is wondering after the Pope. And that's a reference to Revelation 13, verse 3, that says that all the world will marvel and follow the beast. And I, just one more quick, quick comment. President Obama referred to the Pope as His Holiness. John Boehner, when he or the Speaker of the House, when he first announced that the Pope would be coming to America, that they were extending an invitation to him, referred to the Pope as the Holy Father. And as I just look at those statements, I think to myself, that is just not true. As nice of a man as he, as he may be, uh, you look at his pictures and he's just so friendly looking, you just want to hug him. But scripturally, that man is not God's holiness, and he is not the Holy Father. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 11. He prayed to the Holy Father in heaven, and no man deserves that title. Uh, and scripturally, the system that he represents that goes away from the Bible and brings a whole mass of traditions into Christianity is the beast of Bible prophecy. And people need to understand this, and it's time for us to talk about it because time's running out. True, Steve, it really is. And, you know, it, it's, um, when the Bible says the whole world will wonder after the beast, it reminds me of an article that I read recently talking about the Pope's upcoming visit to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And the article said this coming United Nations meeting in September isn't just any United Nations meeting, it's the 70th anniversary and it may be the largest gathering of world leaders in history. So when the Pope comes here to address the United Nations, it's not just any meeting. He may be addressing the largest number of world leaders ever assembled together in one place in history. Wow. So when the Bible says, and all the world wondered after the beast, you can see the literalness of the fulfillment coming up before us. And something else is that the fact is that President Obama cannot gather as big a crowd as the Pope. Neither can uh, Mick Jagger nor Oprah Winfrey. There is no human being on planet Earth that can gather a bigger, a bigger crowd than the Pope. And as, as President Obama said in his statement, which to me was just shocking, he referred to the full moral authority of his position. The world is looking for moral guidance, and he is the one that has surfaced in this generation to become, uh, at least to profess, to be that person. And scripture is being fulfilled. Uh, we have a book that you're familiar with, many of our viewers are familiar with it, called The Great Controversy, written by a little lady named Ellen G. White in the 1800s. And this book, written over 100 years ago, uh, pinpoints what is happening right now. Let me just read a couple of quotations here. It says from, on page 578, the Word of God teaches that Roman Catholics and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of Sunday. That was written over 100 years ago, and it's happening right now. It quotes Revelation 13. It says uh, that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledgement of her supremacy. Since the middle of the 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world. In the events now taking place is seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of this prediction. So 
what was written over a hundred years ago by this lady that many don't like, it's just spot on. She is pointing to the Bible, telling us what prophecy says, and it's happening right now. Now, not only that, here's another quote here. And Steve, might I say that? Sure. When you say that people don't like it, people don't like it because she tells the truth. That's right. They don't like her because she tells the truth. And people, many people love Jesus, but others hated him because he told the truth. Right. Uh, he was crucified at the instigation of religious leaders who didn't want the truth. And but yet Jesus loved, loves, he loved them, he loves us all. And, and we want to make it clear that we have no personal uh, issue with uh, Pope Francis himself or with, uh, with, with Catholic people or Protestants or, or really anyone. We're trying to be faithful to prophecy and to wake people up to what's happening right now. Page 589, in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, we can see the great controversy playing out in front of us. Page 590, these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. So we see they're going to increase. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter 24. Now look at this. Page 605 says, as the question of, enforce, of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated. And we're not quite there yet. It's in the encyclical, but it's, it's coming. The, and the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching then the third angel's message, which is in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12, will produce an effect which it could not have had before. And we are trying to wake people up to the reality that these things are happening right in front of our eyes, and it's time to get back to the Bible. It's time to understand the truth. It's time for us to follow what God says instead of what man has, uh, has, has said and changing God's day. Now, we also want to clarify that Seventh-day Adventists do not believe we're saved by the law. We're not saved by obedience. We're saved through Jesus Christ, our Creator, who became a human being and who loved us so much that He paid the price on the cross for the sins of the whole world. He died because we've broken all these commandments and He can only save us in one way and that is by grace. That's right. And when, his gra when we turn to Him and His grace forgives us, when we repent and trust Him and His grace forgives us, His grace transforms us, His grace shows us His incredible love for sinners like all of us. Uh, then he gives us a new heart. And because we love him, we want to keep his commandments. As John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And some people say, well, that's just Jesus' commandments. But John 14, 15 is actually a quote from the second commandment, which says that God shows mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Steve, what you say is so true. And it is a solemn time to be alive in Earth's history. You know, a couple quick other news reports, because I know our time is running out here. Uh, BBC carried a re news report on May 12 of this year that said scientists are predicting a substantial El Nino event to occur later this year. Meaning that with all the warming of the oceans, they're saying this El Nino event could bring extreme weather to our world starting from September onwards. You know, and a CBS and parallels the Pope's it coming does. here. It all fits together. It does. And then CBS reported uh, just recently uh, about all these crabs being washed ashore in California. And some of you may have, seen, some of our viewers may have seen the report on that. And they say scientists are saying this is an omen of extreme weather coming. And so when the world sees all this extreme weather, and they also see the, the issues with climate change and the need for rest. Steve, earlier you brought up that Fox News article. One of the things that Fox News article said is that people don't have time. It mentions they don't have time for things anymore. So if we don't have time, um, May 23, the New York Daily News said, had an article titled, You Need and Deserve a Secular Sabbath. And in that article, it goes on to say, with all the busy interruptions in our lives, that we are living at the speed of light more than the speed of life. And it goes on to say, it says, perhaps it's no surprise that more and more people, whatever their religion or lack of religion, are turning to the ancient idea of the Sabbath. The only problem is, Steve, is that as society is turning back to the need of rest and the Sabbath, they're actually turning back to Sunday. Right. It's the wrong day. It's the wrong day. And everything is just coming together. We can see it on, on all sides. Uh, the, the climate is here. Prophecy is pending. 
And you mentioned uh, Paul Revere, the quick little story about Paul Revere and how that applies to us today. Well, with Paul Revere, as, as most Americans know, Paul Revere was the man who sounded the alarm when the British were coming, the British army was coming. So when he saw the sign they were coming, he went through New England shouting at the top of his voice, the British are coming, the British are coming, to awaken the colonists to mobilize. So likewise, in today's world, God's people need to be sounding the alarm saying, we can see the end is coming and we need to mobilize. We need to share the gospel with those who don't know it. That's right. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're not saying that those who keep the first day of the week are lost, no. but we are saying that God has a message for this time. I just, I think back that uh, God raised up Noah to give a message. God raised up Jonah to give a message. God raised up John the Baptist to give a message. God raised up Martin Luther to give a message. And God has raised up the Seventh-day Adventist movement to give the message of the three angels, the third angel, to warn about the beast, the second beast, and the mark of the beast in the times that we are living in right now. It's amazing. It's just amazing to see what's happening. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus Christ refers to the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. We are all about to be tested. When these final uh, events take place, the test will be, will we follow the beast or will we follow Jesus Christ? Will we follow the Bible or tradition? Will we follow God or man, uh, the truth or error? The very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, says these words. He said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And those words will be spoken by Jesus when the test comes, everyone makes their choice, and then the doors close. And we're either on God's side or the side of the devil. Uh, verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every one according to his work. Brothers and sisters, the time is at hand. Let's get ready now. Today we have a special offer called the Time is at Hand Information Packet. This offer is only $15 for 10 great pocketbooks, one DVD titled Earth's Final Crisis, and the classic Great Controversy. Don't miss this opportunity to get these resources today. To order your information packet, call 1-800-782-4253 or write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. If you've been blessed by today's program and would like to help Whitehorse Media with your financial support, you can call our toll-free number listed on the screen or donate online at whitehorsemedia.com. We solicit your prayers for our ministry, and we thank you for any gift, large or small, to help us reach people with the gospel 